architects need to become more political. Like we sh we should be the ambassadors for our urban places, and and good you know good place making is so important. And we're the ones that have been educated enough to know about that. Business of Architecture UK, episode thirty four. Hello and welcome, Ryan Willard here, host of the Business of Architecture. I hope you are all well. Uh, this week I had the fantastic opportunity to sit with Shankari Raj. We had a lovely morning discussion uh, whilst looking over the Thames. And uh, Shank really is quite a phenomenal architect. She was originally born in Sri Lanka and she's lived all over the world uh, and spent many, many years here in the UK. She is an educator of architecture. She's taught at Sheffield in the past. She is currently a visiting lecturer at Cardiff University. She's got a wide array of specialist knowledge in architecture, economics, technology, community-led design, and all of her projects, I've got this kind of socio-political engine to them. Um, she's the founder of the Nudge Group, which is a design agency, uh, and they engage a lot in the sort of um, alternative use of parcels of land, and she's able to set up projects which influence the future usage of these lands uh, through temporary projects. And she's working with developers and array of very interesting clients. So in this conversation, Shanks goes into a lot of depth about how she sets up her business and how what kind of things she's modeled her innovative business model on and the influences that she's taken of that. Uh, and also how she goes about ensuring that the community-driven aspects of a project are put at the front uh, and it's really really fascinating conversation so please enjoy hello and welcome to the business of architecture uk i'm here today with shankari raj shankari welcome to the show thanks ryan thank you so much for taking time to be here on this beautiful morning we're overlooking the thames um shankari you're based in bristol and you're the founder and director of The Nudge Group, which is a design agency. So first of all, how did you start? How did you start your company? And I know you've got a very kind of unique ethos about the company, so we're, we're going to that as well. So um, I started it about five years ago, and I have been quite involved in the festival industry, which um, many, many people in the festival industry come out of Bristol. And I was kind of watching their model and I realized we could really work on a, on a similar, more flexible model than we do currently in architecture. And that's really to uh, um, hire freelancers and to work alongside people depending on the project and to get really project specific and to have freelancers working with you on a job by job basis so it just allows you to just really be flexible and be wherever you need to be in the country when working on jobs right so it's kind of like you're building a specific team dependent on the project exactly yeah right okay and so what kind of projects do you involve in i know that you're you do do a lot of architecture but you're also involved in other sorts of design projects so i i kind of started working on um kind of brownfield sites and what we call meanwhile use projects um where we were looking at sites for temporary use especially sort of in 2007 2008 when the when the uh, economic crash happened in the uk looking at these sites as potential for development for a short 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 use that were that had more creative outcomes really and um we'd bring in like event producers and sort of all the social media teams and circus performers and we created a site um next to temple mead station mm. which was one of the first um on um a sort of pre-application basis so it was a really loose planning application that allowed us to deliver um a project for three years on a car park basically right so it's kind of temporary temporary projects yeah it's so we had a bar restaurant and a big top tent for circus and um workspace environments as well which didn't quite happen towards the end because of uh, the funding stream but essentially being able to provide um to transform a brownfield site as a public space mm -hmm. 
um, and bringing in all the subcontractors and all the freelancers to work on it on, on that basis. And how do you go about sort of locating these types of sites or who is the client in this type of project? On, on that particular project, it was the Homes and Communities Agency alongside Bristol City Council. Right. It's often councils, but, it, but now since then, a lot of developers have, have realised there's value in using sites um, whilst they're waiting for applications to go through and activating them because they actually, it actually adds value to, um, to do interesting things with sites rather than them being unoccupied. Yeah, and it kind of builds a, a community around that yeah it does so, totally so is, it, so is this something for like developers who are kind of land banking bits of land or they've got a planning application that's going through or yeah i think it happens both ways since they've realized that meanwhile use can be quite successful um a lot of developers have been using it to to add value to their to their properties so you've, and I know that you've been quite instrumental in driving a lot of change in Bristol and being involved in the kind of political sphere in a way. And yeah. one of your early endeavours, I remember you had a, a coffee shop where you were running sort of community-based projects. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that's a quite a, a really unique and interesting way of engaging with the sort of local demographic. Well, yeah, that takes me back. That was back in 2009. Um, I created something called Love Easton. It's yeah. um, East Bristol, and because it's so close to the city centre, we were noticing loads and loads of planning applications for like tall, tall um, sort of flats and apartment blocks that weren't very tastefully done. Um, and a lot of Victorian terraces, and I, I live in a Victorian terrace in Easton in Bristol, and um, a lot of applications were coming through to turn these terraces into two two bed one bed flats and splitting the houses up and actually it was going to start pushing out families and so one of the first things we did um, as part of Love Easton was to s set the tone for the area and to say outrightly that there was going to be with, as part of the neighborhood plan was to say outrightly there was the that we weren't going to allow transformation of Victorian terraces that they were going to stay as um, one dwelling um, for families because otherwise you'd, it would change the entire demographic of, of the area. Mm. Um, and alongside, and so sort of in line with that, we realised um, that, there was a, that there were lots and lots of derelict sites and lots of underused sites, and the area felt quite unsafe. So I decided to set up a pop up restaurant for six weeks called Love Easton. Um, sell coffees and cakes um, which the community helped with and uh, we put up these big maps and we asked people to tell tell us what they loved about Easton and what they didn't like about Easton and to, to then map those sites out and see what specifics of those areas and what could be done within those areas to to make them feel safer. Mm. And this, this is quite, and this is something that you're kind of, con that ethos is something that you're continuing to do now with the work that you're doing with, was that a nudge group project? That was, was just it? before I set up actually on my own, yeah. And, kind of and, and, and what kind of value do you think, because that's like a, a way of engaging and driving community interest. How can you, how do you approach developers to get them seeing the value in that? How do you sell the value of that to kind of bigger clients? And how does it lead to, more permanent bits of architecture? How does it influence what that site is finally used for? Yes, that's really interesting. I think um, as I've kind of moved on with my career, um, I've become quite vocal about all sorts of things like tall buildings and I need to prioritise food and really sort of big picture policy stuff in line with climate change. And I do have a few developers who um, have been my clients for a while who obviously follow me on Twitter and, and other social media like Instagram and stuff. And so actually they, they come to me because right. they're like, oh, Shanks, we've, we found this site and we're really interested in it. Um, have you got any ideas of, of what we could do with it? And I, was, and I, and I appreciate that, um, you know, they, they've, they obviously need to make money. Um, but there's obviously social value that can be added to the projects that they work on. And we're currently looking at a, a, a huge food hall, actually. I've just been out in Turin at um, a slow food festival looking at how important food is, as especially with the potential of Brexit coming our way. Mm. Um, we've, got to, we've got to prioritise food in, in the entire country. And um, having a food hall where we really look at where the produce is coming from and bringing that into the city and having giant food courts where people can come and eat and taste food and, and that being sort of at ground floor level and, and subsidising the, the rent for that to allow whatever's happening above it becomes a, a much better approach to like that's the specific area that we're looking at at the moment. 
and then I was yeah and I, I guess another thing was I was with count a counselor last week and um in Bristol and she talked about how how badly we need nursery schools so you know that's another thing to plug in to the site is actually could we could we design more affordable healthy environments that are nursery schools because normally they're sort of sort of shoved into small like basements and stuff mm. in various areas because they're they're needed so badly and and actually making sure that we design them properly is so important and how does and how does doing temporary projects kind of start to influence the design so so with the temporary element of it that what that's done we we did a document as well for the london legacy development corporation back in 2012 to look at how to use the queen elizabeth park that's the um, olympics yeah the olympics site as a as a temporary use site for various different activities for the community and it's about community activation it's about engaging the people in that area to that development to um what's happening and making them feel part of their urban landscape mm. and doing it on a real local level so it's not about big development developers or big investment it's about what people at street level get to engage with and how those communities strive and and with meanwhile use projects that is at the heart of it because it's not about putting it's not about the concrete jungle it's not about creating it's about the temporary and it's actually something that grows it's it's not about valuing GDP. It's about saying actually slow growth is okay. Yeah. And we can develop a site really slowly and the community can be engaged and participate in that process without just landing something big um, at their door. And it, it kind of also interrupts the normal status quo of like either land banking, holding onto land, or like just putting planning application after planning application and stripping the value out of land and just you know it goes up and up and up then all you can actually physically build on it is something huge so yeah exactly and yeah because of that value i think that's a big problem that we have at the moment in bristol is um the kind of they're, they're about to put a supplementary planning document to allow for tall buildings um and say actually 10 plus buildings is okay um but actually that's not that's just dividing and like it's, it's it makes the rich the divide between the rich and the poor that much greater mm. and it's just encouraging big developers to come in to build tower blocks or skyscrapers and um and not put affordable housing on them mm. and that's not acceptable really we we're sort of starting to follow this american model and actually europe's done it pretty well like five to seven stories with you know wide streetscapes allowing interactions at ground level is so important and big tower blocks all that does is have end up with half a million pound flats and it doesn't encourage for affordable housing at all yeah well, it ends up being kind of they are financial instruments primarily as opposed to housing so yeah. they end up being investment tools yeah they're investment tools and no one's living in them <laughs> yeah which has a massive impact on on a city so how do you start to make the economic argument to developers how do you how do you go about doing that? Because obviously, like the slow growth, it goes against the kind of, you know, uh, the sort of profit mechanisms of most large corporations. And people are looking for quick wins so often, particularly in property. How do you go about structuring the economic argument or proving that, that it, how it works? So I think it's a lot of it's about education and it's about. <clears throat> the the developers that are a bit more sympathetic and 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 aware of what's going on mm. um you know if we're looking at the bigger problems of migration and climate change the the kind of the the, the bigger effect of that comes down to a local level and and making them aware how important like local infrastructure is local communities and local like things like local f food um growth is and educating them on that really and making them aware that you having sort of expensive flats and apartments is great but that's not going to deal with the problems day, the day-to-day -day problems that we have and some developers obviously aren't going to be okay with that because they've got one thing on their mind and that's making maximum profit whereas others can see the potential of having buildings or being ambassadors for buildings that are going to sort of lots stand the test of time and how do you do that and how do you then encourage for example this is this is potentially going to be office development with a food hall on the ground floor what that encourages is 
people who want to have, have healthy food and be part of that environment, they then want to move into that building. And then that becomes a long-term plan rather than it just being turned into apartment blocks. Mm. Um, bringing offices into the city centre again at affordable rents. And also, like, I can see you're creating real senses of place with those kinds of characteristics. If you've got like a food hall or something or a marketplace, that starts to define the characteristics of, a, of an entire area, which has, you know, that will facilitate long-term growth over, you know, over, over a period of time, which is much more economically beneficial for everybody. Yeah, totally. I mean, if we, if we continue to just turn city centres into sort of, um, you know, maximum gain, putting big apartment blocks and flats in them, then th all that's happened is people have moved to the outskirts. People are being moved out because they can't afford rents and they can't afford to have offices in the city centre. And that's why a lot of like artists and creatives in Bristol are having to move out to Wales now. It's a, it's a problem like with all major cities that has to be stopped. And that's why quite a few buildings now, they're trying to get sort of crowdfunding and turn them into community assets so that they stay in the city centre. Or mm. you end up with a, a monoculture in the city without any of the creativity left. Mm. So for, for you personally, um, how have you been going about campaigning this? What kind of sort of strategies do you use to build awareness to get your message out? Um, I, I think a lot of people are quite clear with my message in Bristol. It, um, I do write articles on it. So yep. I'll, um, often Bristol 24-7 will ask me to write an article on my views on tall buildings or the arena site or, you know, some of the sort of small levels of corruption that happens within, within the government. Um, and then I tweet about it as well. So that's my, my kind of direction in kind of making it clear to people that these things are, are not okay. And, and I think architects need to become more political. Mm. Like we, sh we should be the ambassadors for our urban places. And, and good, you know, good placemaking is so important. And we're the ones that have been educated enough to know about that. Mm. And if we're not the ones who are advocating it and we're just allowing sort of big developers and big investment companies to come in and build what they want then it's not going to create healthy environments mm. and how can we do that well i think we've got to start campaigning more i think um sort of terry farrell's farrell view was one was a, a good start at it but it didn't end up going anywhere and this is a problem that we have is we need a minister you, in can architecture you, can you recap what that was um the farrell view was basically looking at the the impact um, that architecture has on the built environment and a series of um, kind of policy change making ideas to encourage better places um, and one of the big things was that we really need um, a minister for architecture and we don't have one it's kind of hidden within the communities department and whereas like the construction industry has their own minister so that's yeah. one of the first things that needs to change if we're going to have a voice in central government. Yeah, well, we now have the uh, the BBBB <laughs> <laughs> bit of policy that came out. Have you seen that? No. Uh, the the beautiful buildings. Oh yes, image, the beautiful buildings. Which yeah. Everybody's yeah. <laughs> I did see that. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, uh, that's not what it's about, yeah. is it? We need to. The councils need to start building housing. It's not about beautiful housing. It's about affordable housing. Yeah. And the council, we need to go back to the 60s, and we need to start building again. And it needs to not be led by developers who then find some way of getting out of building like housing that's of a normal rate. Mm. And how, how do you think that this, because I mean, nowadays, a lot of younger architects are very socially aware, like socially driven, that becomes the priority of a lot of young practices. What do you think are the obstacles that face, that those practices face, particularly when they're first starting out, and they want to engage in socially driven projects, they want to be pushing that kind of agenda? What are the, you know, what's the main sort of obstacles they face and how can they start to overcome them? And, and run profitable practices themselves? I think um, I'd become, I would suggest that they become their own client. I think that one of the best ways is probably to set up your own projects and make them happen yourself. Nice. And um, find the investment from more socially minded sources to help deliver the projects that you want to deliver. And is this something you've done yourself? We've kind of 
tried to on a few occasions and I'm going to go back to it again I think it, we were trying to do a floating swimming pool and sort of um, spa on a on a public space that was south facing next to the floating harbour in Bristol um, but it we worked on it for a year and a half and didn't quite get off the ground um, Creative Common was one that we really directed and developed and delivered in so that's in, Creative that? Common was um, the, the Brownfield car park site next to Temple Me Station that we oh, put okay, the big top right, tent right. on so that was something that we did uh, direct and deliver so that was but you, you do have to work um, harmoniously with the council to make those sorts of projects happen and mm. the problem that has happened in the last I'd say four or five years is the councils of their their budgets have been cut so the people that they would have involved to help and like grow those sorts of projects aren't there anymore. So it's the last four or five years, it's been really difficult to deliver those more socially minded projects on, on interesting sites. But that's, that's the way to kind of push sort of a, a social agenda yeah. that thinks more about public space and, and people. And do you ever approach the landowners directly or is it normally council owned land or? Um, I haven't as yet. And, Except for the projects that I work on with with developers, um, we haven't worked on any specifically with a with a developer that isn't looking to turn it into much more. Because I guess with the sort of projects that you do that are meanwhile use or small scale, they've been single story, like two story buildings. So developing it past that hasn't happened so much. Got it. Yeah. So, and what's your involvement with the economics of happiness? What's Oh wow, that was that's a really interesting one. It's um, called the Economics of Happiness. is a, is a film that came out in New York in 2011, and the organisation is called Local Futures. Um, it's a global organisation, and it's very much about localising our economy. I came about um, it in a roundabout way, very accidentally, through um, being friends with a gentleman called Alistair Sorday, who's got Canopy and Stars and um, Sorday's, which is about independent local bed and breakfasts um, around uh, Europe and the UK. And uh, I, was, I met him after a talk by Peter Clegg, actually, and we'd both come out into the sunshine at the harbour front and in Bristol. And he said, oh, what are you doing now? And I said, um, I don't have any plans. And he said, do you want to go for some cocktails? I've got some friends coming over from Australia. And I said... Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. And um, we ended up chatting to his friends, who uh, Helen and Norberg Hodge, and her husband John. And and uh, and I soon realised how aligned me and Helen were. Helen and John and Alistair were all in their seventies, and how aligned I was with Helena's thinking about things. And uh, she was in Bristol for two weeks, and she said, "Why don't you take me out and show me show me show me the town? Because I haven't lived in Bristol since the '90s." And I said, "Yeah, sure." And the um, more I spoke to, the more I realised that everything she was saying was what I wrote in my master's thesis, sort of 15 years before that. And um, realised, having picked up the CD from the loft of my master's thesis, that I had quoted Helena four times in my master's thesis, which was what about was making development sustainable and how it was right. a paradigm and. I looked at Sri Lanka in the UK as a case study and how um, sort of big development and big business and advertising and marketing was playing a huge, um, it was playing a huge part in the well-being of people um, in Sri Lanka and it was, and, and people were really become, uh, really started to become depressed and the welfare of people had changed and that was very much to do with big business and that's, what Local Futures is about. And, she, and so she asked me to be an associate director of her company. And um, so they have uh, conferences all over the world in Japan, North Korea. She's, Helen is a sort of global superstar in Asia. Her, she's got a book called Ancient Futures, um, which, which really looks at how we need to make minimal impact, uh, the issues of climate change, big picture politics, and... Um, food growing it's 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 everything rolled into one and how we need to localize and have to really think about biodiversity and what's your what's your role in the organization um i get involved when and where i can so if i can head out to conferences then i do so we were in florence a couple of years ago um last month we had our 18th conference in bristol um and so we had some major players in economics field talking about how big business and how we need to um, reinvest and think about where we put our money. What, what do you think that an architect brings to these types of conversations when looking at big business and its impact on, on the city? Because it's quite an interesting 
like way of looking at the growth of cities and architects obviously we've got a very unique set of tools to be able to unpick things uh, and discuss them well yeah i i mean one of the things that helena made me realize was that cities are not where sustainability happens so this conversation about oh we need to be um more people in a smaller area makes us more sustainable is is not actually where the figures or the facts lie. Actually, if we're all using the land and working off the land and um, using biodiversity rather than large farming practices, and then we look at the cityscape and we look at kind of building high rise and big business and how they're influencing and they're impacting other like land masses globally, and we take all of that into account, that's where the issues around climate change are really happening. So in line with your question, I think that we've got, we, we can see big picture and mm. we can also see the well-being of people and that's about environments and that's not necessarily, like you can see it's so, in a city it's so hard to see or read um, where those issues are coming from. And it's not till you spend some time in a small village. So I, I went and spent eight months in um, the village that I was born in, in Sri Lanka last year. And um, I really n noticed the kind of conversations that I was having with local people from the village. Who'd, and their real interest was to move to a city. So their perception of progress is to be living in a big city and to have the iPhone and to have a car and to end up living in a tiny squalor of, a, of accommodation in a tower block somewhere in Colombo in Sri Lanka. Mm. And they did not value the fact that the cows are roaming free and they're not, you know, being churned through a system and the chickens and the cockerels are free range and they just are and all the food's organic and that just is. Mm. Um, their, the, their value system is different. I, I went and bought a bike and they were like, why are, you, why are you riding a bike when you could afford to have a car? And I was like, because I don't need a car. I, I genuinely do not need a car when I've got a bicycle that can get me everywhere I need to from the market and back and to deal with builders on, on this site that I was working on. And, and it's when you start to see the effect that big business is having in a tiny village in Sri Lanka where Samsung screen, in, in this tiny village, like it's eight hours away from the nearest airport, there's huge Samsung TV screens and shiny big fluorescent lights and, and, um, and you realise that, that that's where the conversation really needs to be had is, is with big business. In what sense? It's because of their the the sort of pervasive influence of their advertising and marketing, which is yeah. So so what that results in is um, uh, what the problem that we have now is with people's unhappiness is directly related to their debt, and that is related to direct debits and related to insurances and um, wanting to have that car so they've got it on loan and they're paying that off monthly. So all these monthly bills are causing people to be really stressed and depressed, but they, they, need, they want and need all of these things to, to live because they think that's what they need. And as a result, they've also got a, a, piling, a debt that's piling up month mm. on month. People used to live seasonally, so you know you had your own money, and that, and it, it often wasn't even cash. You know, you're you're doing something for someone, and they're doing something for you, and it's not even based on, on um, on a on on cash in in the way we know it. Mm. It's based on us, you know, working together and sharing things, and that changes as like soon. Like a bartering as, system. Yeah, too. and and that really changes as soon as you've got to deal with a direct debit that's coming in every month. Mm. that you're having to pay off when actually if you're if you're a seasonal worker there's sometimes the year where you're not making money mm. so how do you make how do you make that stack up in in the way that we're expected to live because actually if these big businesses have direct debits like amazon coming out of our account every month um they know they they can sort of they have financial targets and they can meet them and they can use that money in other ways to 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 buy other smaller companies and that's where this this growing divide between the rich and the poor is coming from. Mm. And so what is an alternative? What's an alternative for these for smaller communities to be more self sustaining? Well, I think there's a there's a whole generation that that needs to come through the system to realize and, for and, example in Sri Lanka. And and how and how do you and how do you work with 
um, bigger, larger organizations as well. Again, it's a very similar conversation, I suppose, to the larger developers that we're having in London and Bristol, where you're kind of portraying a certain kind of lifestyle and the marketing and the advertising is all pervasive. It's just like deep, so deeply inset in all of our culture that that's the status quo. It's rare that we might even question it. So, so the question is, how do we... Yeah, what do you, how do you engage with the larger organizations? How do you in, engage with... Because obviously they're a key part of this. Of this situation, yeah. yeah. Um, I think the, one of the big things we need to do is start taxing or we need to sort of... I uh, read an article this morning about sort of bankrupting the, the, the coal industry. So one of the one of the key things that we can do that's going to deal with climate change, which is then going to encourage people to re-engage with their landscape, is is that. I think that if even with big business, if we can encourage them to divest from the coal industry, mm. then that's going to be a massive player. And then on top of that, if they start to invest their money, in, not in the normal banking system, but in community banks like we've got, we're lucky enough to have Triodos Bank in Bristol, which is a is a is a is a really good community sort of sustainable banking system. And that's what we have to do. We have to get these companies to get themselves out of. The, the big banks and that that's that's for us as individuals as well mm, to make and, the choice yeah to make those choices and to really think about where we put our money yeah so you know when working with developers i can say look at least at ground floor level how about we look at really looking at small independent businesses to put them in these shop fronts and get them and encourage them to do that makes all the difference mm. to to shopping locally and using that and changing the economic mm. system it's really, it's really fascinating, actually, the kind of ideas of alternative forms of, you know, uh, exchanging value. Do you yourself in your practice ever do that? Do you ever use a bartering system? Have you ever, like, exchanged services with other companies or anything like that and it's been successful or it's worked? Yeah, a lot of the time I'll be doing, you know, I might, I do a lot of maps for festivals, so infrastructure, layout maps, and then I'll get some free tickets and then they'll pay me in another way. Like, there's just so many ways that we do that all the time with our friends. Like, most of my friends, I'm lucky enough to have a, a really wonderful circle of friends who all have their own businesses and are quite independently and sustainable, mm. sustainable thinking. And we do use, we do often do each other favors all the time. And I'll be like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll draw that up for you if you know if you do this. But only on that level, on that really sort of local, small scale level. Yeah, I think it's really interesting as well because this this idea of the festival culture. I mean, like you've got things like Burning Man, for example, which is a good example of a totally alternative way of. Um, you know, financing where everything is a gift essentially, yeah. and when you've got it in these kind of closed ecosystems, it gives people an opportunity to experience it and to actually start thinking very differently and then, and kind of start taking an idea. Well, it plants the seed of an idea of how you know this could be implemented in another way. Yeah, totally. So I've been quite heavily involved with Shambhala Festival for the last 10 years now. Right. And um, so I, I help with their maps and um, we kind of talk about the ethos of the organization a lot. And it's never had any um, commercial advertising. It's uh, It was the first festival to bring out eco bonds. So you pay an extra £10 with your ticket and you recycle and you get your £10 in cash back as you're leaving the festival. Mm -hmm. And it introduced um, the cup scheme. So instead of having plastic or glass on site um you have a cup and you pay a pound and then you give back the cup and then you and then you refill your pint um and so it's gone further in the last two years to be vegetarian as well to be a fully vegetarian festival and uh, it's a great example of um creating a microcosm it's, which it essentially is you know with the festival site you've got 18,000 people who have come onto a site that's sort of cornered off and you can kind of test ideas like city sort of ideas of how people should live and work and think and you can encourage them to look at things differently as well and it's a really festivals are a, a really interesting way to to create environments that you would otherwise like to see in the real world <laughs> yeah 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 totally and i'm actually quite curious because you mentioned that you were in sri lanka last was it last year the year before? last year yeah and you were there for eight months and you kind of got a very first-hand experience of how big business was influencing 
So what were you what were you doing out there? You you were on a I know you were doing a small project. Yeah, so I was um I was out there initially to just scope it out and um potentially build a house for myself and my parents. Right. Um so my for my parents to retire to, but alongside that we have lots of other land. So um the area's been the area's been war torn for thirty years. Um and I was born out there during the war. Um yeah, which uh, was in 19, I was born in 82, and it's uh, the war happened in April of 1983, the first bomb went off. And um, my dad and mum were living in Africa and flew back to give birth to me and then to fly back again, but couldn't and um, because the war had started and my dad had had a house built. So he'd saved all his money uh, being a maths teacher in Africa and saved all his money to have this house built, which uh, my parents never got to live in. And so it became uh, something that had been at the back of my mind for a really long time to kind of go back and look at the site because it got bombed in 2001 and then the war ended in 2009. So the idea was to go back and really uh, look at the site and see if it's even worth rebuilding it and and how to go about doing that. And then whilst I was there, it kind of all kicked off and we decided to just make it happen. So I, I got the house built in sort of four months whilst I was there with the intention of it being a base because I'm quite den-like in my, in my manner. So I needed my own den before I can then go to look at doing other things. Right. And when that happens, I don't know, but I do, the other things I, I want to build out there are sort of nursery schools and we've talked about um, a cycle network and doing like a raw food cafe along cycle points across the northern coast, which is a lot more flat lying in Sri Lanka. So the, there's a lot of potential and there's a lot of interesting things that we I want to go back and do. It's just kind of finding the time to do it in between working mm. here in the UK as well. And, and what have been the lessons that you've learned from doing that project out in Sri Lanka and working in that kind of environment and economy and culture and that you've been able to bring back and implement here? Um, what I've realised is builders are the same, <laughs> whether you're in Sri Lanka or the UK. <laughs> it's the same kind of whining and the same sort of like, oh, I'm not getting paid enough, wh whichever subcontractor you've got. And you're trying to sort of be quite stern and be like, no, you haven't done the job right, or that's not quite right. And no, you have to finish it before I'm going to finish paying you. And, you know, all those sorts of conversations are quite similar. Um, I've always had the same ethos, so I don't know how much I've brought back, to be honest. Right. Um, I... I've always known what's been going on in Sri Lanka, especially having written my master's thesis about the two, the two kind of diverging cultures, which are really coming, which are really coming together now, actually, with the change in politics. So there's there's a global political movement at the moment with these sort of right wing govern, governments that have come in and. And the effect on that is is a global problem now. I had a message actually from one of my good friends from Sri Lanka yesterday going, I'm leaving Sri Lanka. I think I've had enough because the politics has just changed again. And um, and I was like, I, I wouldn't bother moving is what I replied to. The problem's global now. And he's like, you're right. <laughs> mm. So what's next? What's next for you? What's next for Nudge, the Nudge group? What's next for Nudge? Um, well, I've got a few projects with private clients at the moment that I'm working through. Um, in the next five years, I'd like to go spend a bit more time in Sri Lanka and develop some of these more social projects and turn them into cooperatives that, um, that are sort of community-owned assets. So we kind of develop one, franchise it, and give it out to the community to to deliver. And there's a few different models of things like um, more creative nursery schools. We've talked about sort of um, the bird watching life out there and creating bird hides and r the raw food movement and cafes. So there's a few different ideas that we've got to hopefully bring back uh, a more thriving local economy to Sri Lanka. So that's that's the next driver. You, you mentioned community assets. What do you mean by that? So you can um, you can basically have community bonds and community share offers. So you can de develop um, a project. So a really good example is the Bristol Ferry Company in Bristol, which is all um, it's all own it's owned by the community. So they've all got shares. People in so thousands of people in the community have shares in it. Mm. Another example is Bristol Cable, which is um, an independent. Um, uh, newspaper that prints monthly and everyone puts in three pounds a month so that you've got a much more independent um, offering for our news. Amazing. Shankari, that's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Thanks, Ryan. My pleasure. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. 
The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.